worship this morning and celebrate the Reformation. And just a quick note, our very first hymn, I Greet Thee Who My Sure Redeemer Art, is attributed to John Calvin. They're not sure, so it's attributed to him. And then we're gonna sing A Mighty Fortress Is Our God, which is, of course, Martin Luther. So we'll, we will sing our Reformation hymns today. Now, I'd like to ask you to center your hearts and minds on worship as we listen to the organ prelude.
God, call us to worship, to service, to mission. Word which can set us free. In the word we hear God's voice calling us, challenging us, and teaching us. In the word is our freedom. In the word we meet Christ, our hope, our help, our refuge, and our redeemer. Please join me in the prayer of the day. Almighty God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort us in times of trial. Defend us against all enemies of the gospel and bestow on the church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
we can no longer flatter ourselves about how good we are. We only need to confess our weaknesses and our failures, and God promises grace and mercy. Let us confess our sins before, let us con confess our sins before and one another. O oh God of mercy, we lament that even good actions of reform and renewal had often unintended negative consequences. We bring before you the burdens of the guilt of the past when our forebears did not follow your will that all be one in the truth of the gospel. We confess our own ways of thinking and acting that continue the divisions of the past. As communities and as individuals, we build many walls around us, mental, spiritual, physical, political walls that result in discrimination and violence. Forgive us, Lord. Amen. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He is our peace. He breaks down the walls that divide. He gives us, through the Holy Spirit, ever new beginnings. In Christ, we receive forgiveness and reconciliation, and we are strengthened. Thanks be to God. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us share the signs of reconciliation and peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Please greet one another with the peace of Christ.
I don't see any small children here, but we're all children, so I'm going to give you my junior, junior sermon. Um, our foundation as one of the Reformed tradition denominations, and it's a big, broad label, Reformed, and that includes Presbyterians and United Church of Christ, Congregationalists, the Reformed Church in America, the Christian Reformed Church, they're all part of the Reformed tradition. And most of that comes from John Calvin, who was French. However, especially in this country, we have a strong stake in our Scottish roots as well, through John Knox and the Presbyterians in Scotland. In fact, the Kirk of Scotland is a Presbyterian church. And you know that in Scotland there are clans. And if any of you are Irish or Scottish or Welsh, you've been probably been looking for your tartan, your clan tartan. Well, it's a tradition that when you become a clergy, when you are ordained to the ministry of word and sacrament, you have to give up your clan. So this is the clergy tartan. And there are actually two of them, and I like this one best. I don't know if it's a very old tradition, but I like it because it is a witness to our commitment to follow Christ above all. So, there's your history lesson for the day. <laughs> Let us have a prayer. Holy God, we are grateful for those who have gone before us, who teach us, and who leave us a witness of their faith. So continue to guide us so that we may be witnesses to faith for future generations and show our love of Christ and of one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Amen. Our first scripture reading for today comes from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. <clears throat> Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers, when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it upon their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each man teach his neighbor and each brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Please join me in responsively reading Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Though the earth should change, though the mountains shake, in the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult, the river and streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he brings on the earth. He makes the war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge.
Our New Testament lesson comes from Romans chapter 3, verses 19 through 28. Continue to listen for the word of the Lord. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human will be justified before him by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested to by the law and the prophets and the righteousness of God through the faith of Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to demonstrate at the present time his own righteousness so that he is righteous and he justifies the one who has the faith of Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. Through what kind of law? That of works. No, rather through the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, I just want to take that whole passage and kind of pull it apart. There's a lot in there. Well, over 500 years ago, Martin Luther put 95 theses, 95 ideas, on the church door in Wittenberg. And this came because he had been watching the practice of indulgences. People would pay so much to the church, and then their time in purgatory would be cut short, and they were guaranteed salvation. And he kept reading Romans. He was an Augustinian monk, he was a professor, he was a theologian, a hymn writer, and an ordained priest. And he was teaching at a university, and he was teaching a course one semester on Psalms and on Romans, and he read this passage. They are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption of Jesus Christ. You can't buy salvation, you can't buy grace. As a young man, Luther was caught in a thunderstorm, lots of lightning, and he promised God he would devote himself to the study and practice of the word if he was saved from the lightning. He, he was a very well-known person and had quite a temper. But thanks to Martin Luther, things got started. It wasn't the first. There were other groups that had moved away from the, um, moved away from the main church, the Roman church. But then, a few years later, we have John Calvin. Now, John Calvin was born in Paris. His father was an administrator and deacon in the church, and he decided that his son was going to go to seminary. Well, things got kind of ugly in the church, and so his father, along with John, decided that he would go to law school, and he did. But he got caught up in all this religious struggle in Paris, and finally had to run away, and he ran away to Geneva, Switzerland. He very quickly became the leader of the Reformation happening there in Geneva. And then he got into trouble with the consistory, the ruling body, and he had to leave Geneva, and he went to Strasbourg, France, and came back to Geneva when they needed him. They called for him to come back. One of the interesting parts about this I find fascinating is John Calvin would preach a sermon every day 
Old Testament during the week, New Testament on Sundays. And he just started with Genesis 1 and worked his way through. And after being gone for three years, he got up in the pulpit at the church in Geneva and said, now where were we? <laughs> the other great story about John Calvin that I love and has nothing to do with the church, he, when he was teaching, he was never ordained as a priest. He was a lawyer and a theologian. So when you read our book of order, think about that. He was teaching a class, and there were people outside, and they were making a lot of noise. They didn't have any respect for John Calvin. They were playing tennis and making a lot of noise. So he very quickly got the consistory of Geneva to make a law that you cannot speak or make noise during tennis matches. And to this day, tennis matches are played in silence. Well, our, th our third visitor today is Pope Paul III. Now, he's not the one who excommunicated Martin Luther. That was Pope Leo X. He became pope in 1534. And he did a lot of good things. With all this Reformation stuff happening on and, and the divisiveness and sometimes the violence that occurred, he was the one who decided maybe the Catholic Church did need some Reformation. And he is the pope who called the Council of Trent in 1537 and, and brought some reforms to the church. There are some watchword phrases from the Reformation that are important. Sola Scriptura, scripture only has authority. Sola Fide, by faith alone, as our text said, Solo gratia, grace alone. Solo Christus, by Christ alone. Replacing the priestly caste, the sacraments, and salvation are all um, important and have efficacy because they're involved with Christ. And finally, soli Deo Gloria, glory to God alone. In some of our churches, you will see in their bulletins um, the ministers, all the people of God. That parody of laity and, and the priestly caste or the clergy caste was a central point of our Reformation as Presbyterians. Well, Reformation Sunday is a time to recognize and celebrate our heritage of reforming the church, reformed by the Word of God and the Spirit of God. In the midst of great changes, even now, we are looking for a center, a foundation, a dependable absolute that we can point to and say, there, there is our foundation. It's unmovable, it's the center, it's the truth. For Christians, this is the absolute truth that the center cannot be moved or changed. Today, we have the opportunity to meet three great Christian leaders, Martin Luther, John Calvin, and Pope Paul III. On earth, they never met each other. In fact, Lutherans and Calvinists, Reformed Christians, and Roman Catholics often struggled violently against each other. But God rules from eternity. Part of God's plan to make all things new is to help us gain perspective on who we are as God's children, and in that light, we are to confess our sins to God and to each other and to forgive each other. So imagine the place where God is all in all. The time, eternity. And here Martin Luther, John Calvin, and Pope Paul III can worship God together and speak courteously to each other. Gentlemen, if we were still living on earth, do you know what today would be? What a mark. You still think rather highly of yourself. I know you're thinking it's what some call Reformation Day. And you invented it. Well, after the year 1517, that was a day to remember. If I must say so myself, it wasn't the easiest thing in the world to write 95 points about the Christian faith and to open up that debate. Martin, I'd still prefer to call you Father Martin, for you were a priest. But then I must remember that we did remove you from the church. I still regret it. Anyway, Martin, you so 
certainly started the debate. Some have said you divided the church and started wars among Christians. And while you'd like to call the Reformation Day, many remember it as All Hallows Eve, the day before All Saints Day. Too bad that has become only a night for candy and skeletons. But how could anyone from our time forget those 95 pieces that you nailed on the door of Capitol Church in Wittenberg? Now, I can appreciate why you did that. But at the time, I was furious. Well, Father Paul. But I'll call you Brother Paul now. There was so much for me and many others to be furious about. Much of the Roman Catholic Church was a corrupt mess. The practice of Christianity was a cartoon of what Jesus' first followers had practiced. Mark, by the way, you start to get steamed up. I remember hearing a lot about your hot temper. That never really helped your cause, even though many of your ideas were sound. Still, you rediscovered what St. Augustine had thought more than a thousand years before, justification by faith. Thank you, Brother John. I'll try to watch myself. Of course, Augustine was not the first to teach justification by faith. He merely taught what St. Paul had written long before him. Justification. It's all about how God saves people. That was the seed of what came to be called the Reformation. Please, Brother Paul, I should think that by now you'd admit that by the 16th century, the church had sunk to a new low point. It had stolen salvation away from God and was trying to run God's show. Martin, I agree with John Calvin. You still exaggerate and seem almost to try to inflame people for the sake of faith, even now in eternity, in God's believing presence. But you have, but you have a point. You never said that the Roman Catholic Church saved people, but you always said that God saves and forgives through Christ's death. Well, I'm not exaggerating now, friends. You and the Church always insisted that, quote, no one could be saved outside the Church, end quote. I'm just quoting one of your own Church's documents. Along with many others, I tormented myself because of that teaching. We were never sure that we were saved. We always felt that we had to prove ourselves good enough so the church would say we were forgiven. I remember hearing about your torment. When you were alone, you whipped yourself. Until I was bleeding. For years I did that, trying to convince myself of my salvation. And you insisted that it was the church's fault. Because the church stood between God and people. You kept people captive to the church and made them wallow in guilt so they never come to know God and God's great salvation. Mark, it's starting to boil again. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'll try harder. Anyway, I never realized that God's sheer undeserved grace to all sinners saved us, not until I actually studied the Bible. Then I worked through Paul's letters to the Romans and Galatians and saw a light I'd never seen before, because the church didn't trust lay people with the Bible. Martin, I've got to hand it to you there. You were as good as your word translated the whole Bible into contemporary German, but without the help of early printers, the Bible could never have found its way into the hands of priests and scholars, and later into homes in the entire European society. Martin's work also encouraged the revival in preaching. Preaching had nearly disappeared from worship. From the fall, worship revolved around the Mass. In the Mass, the Church focused mainly on Jesus' crucifixion, but Jesus' death was only part of salvation, just as important he conquered death in the resurrection. Up from the grave he rose, then sunk in churches for years. No crucifixion, no forgiveness. But no resurrection means no salvation, no new life, only the guilt that Mark described and suffered. So my complaints about the Mass were that he would virtually kill Jesus again and again every time he asked to celebrate it. We consider that last week. Brother John, you too have a way of over I suppose so, but I believe you get the point. In fact, your whole church these days on earth is getting that point. One of your successors, Pope John Paul, said over and over, this is more that unites us than divides us. One thing that unites us now, and I'm glad you've come to see it more play, is that preaching has strongly awakened the Catholic churches. Once more, Bible study is growing in ways that you discouraged in your day. Brother Paul, you have to admit, somewhat more Protestant in recent years. Your people 
sing and worship, maybe not as well as Reformed people, but they're getting there. We keep learning. Priests are preaching from scriptures that were silent in the churches for centuries. Many Roman Catholics are studying the Bible as never before. But we are still not completely agreed about the central point of justification. Does God save us because he is completely gracious in giving us Christ? Or does God save us because somehow we draw ourselves closer to God? You and your church are not completely clear on that, Brother Paul. You still emphasize doing good works to prove a person's worth, and you still claim that the church is the gateway to a saving relationship with God. But you Calvinists and Lutherans have always made salvation too easy. You confess only to God, not to each other. No visible authority keeps you together. There is still one Roman Catholic Church with many branches, but there are more than 20,000 Protestant denominations, many of them independent, squabbling with each other. The Calvinist Reformed Church is split so quickly and easily. Our witness is divided. Perhaps we have divided Christ because we haven't listened to God or to each other. We have been swayed by other considerations. We always need forgiveness for that. But what does unite us, really? Doesn't Christ poured out blood flow over all of us? Don't we all believe that it is God who saves? God makes us right. We don't do that ourselves. We are utterly dependent on God. Mark, you are still preaching that? You're worse than a dog with a fresh bone. But you are right. We disagree about the function of the church. We disagree about how God gives us salvation. But we have come to agree that it is God and God alone who gives it. Thank, Thank God, God for that. that. And we have come to that because we have read the same scripture. We come to that agreement only when we trust first and last in God's spirit to guide our hearts, our reading, our study, and our worship. I have to admit that the people who call themselves reform today have learned about God's spirit from that group of independent churches called charismatic or Pentecostal. We have to trust God's spirit more. We have to celebrate together. And that is why we are here today. We are a part of God's eternity, united by God's grace with many whom we have fought in the past. We are here in this time and place to mourn divisions, but also to celebrate what unites us, whether we're Lutheran, Calvinist, Catholic, Baptist, or Pentecostal. We are here because God calls us here through scripture and preaching to hear God's word. We are here to remember Christ's death and his resurrection, believing that Christ died to give his people new life so that they can live close to God and closer to each other. One of the things that is happening in our time, which is very encouraging and exciting, is that there is more ecumenical and interfaith dialogue than ever. And we are finding common ground with one another. As we tell our stories to each other, I think you would discover that there are all kinds of stories about other denominations, other congregations that have encouraged our faith and nurtured us. So we give thanks to God for the Reformation, for these three fine but flawed leaders, and for all those who came after them that brought us to this point. And we ask that God continue to guide us as the Church of Christ on earth. Amen.
affirmation of faith for today is taken from the brief statement of faith from the Presbyterian Church USA and it was written at the time the two churches the North and South reunited into the PCUSA. Let us say this together. In life and in death we belong to God through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. We trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people, to live as one community. But we rebel against God. We hide from our Creator. Ignoring God's commandments, we violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, explore neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation, yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant, like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home. God is faithful with believers in every time and place. We rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Just a few announcements. A reminder that we have a congregational meeting following this worship service. It is over in Fellowship Hall, complete with donuts. Um, and it is a public meeting, so even if you are not a member, you are welcome to attend the meeting. Members have voice and vote, but you're welcome to be part of the meeting anyway. Um, there's a trick-or-treating here at 3.30 on Tuesday because that's Halloween. And if you haven't seen Halloween in Branchville, you just don't want to miss it. You really don't. So if you can come and you want to come in costume and help you hand out candy to children, what a great thing to do on a Tuesday afternoon. Next week, <clears throat> November 5th, we are going to observe All Saints Day. And if you have a loved one who has passed away in the last year, please give their name to the office, to Alicia. Uh, what we will do is remember them by naming them and, and a special prayer for those who are now with God. I have no other announcements. You can read the rest of them at the end of the uh, bulletin. So let us turn our hearts and minds to prayer. And we have several prayer requests. For Jean Ransom, who is doing better. Uh, she is in Care One in Morristown and doing well. Rose and Edmund Zukowski, Irene and Fred. For Linda, for Paul Opilla, Tom Coulter. We pray for Israel and Palestine for our brothers and sisters who are there in the midst of that horrible violence. For Greg, Mr. Mr. Pipers, and Wendy Pipers. For Paula Clark's mother and mother-in-law. Prayers for Esther, Beth, Nia, Elizabeth, Dorothy. For the Prohl family upon the death of Beth Prohl. For Michelle, Edie, for little Edward, for Anne and family on the loss of a sister Pat, for Beth, for baby Matt, Andrew, Etta, Michelle and Eric, 
for Marion, for Tammy, for Bob McDowell. And there are others whom we name in our hearts that we pray for. So let us gather together and pray. Holy God, on this day we remember the great saints of the faith, for those who have led the way into new directions and to help create new things in your name. Guide us so that all that we do is to your glory, that it does not become selfish or arrogant, but rather we are trying to do the right thing and be witnesses to your love and your grace and the many gifts you give to us. We ask for your healing touch upon those who are ill in mind or body and spirit, especially those we have named before you today. We also ask for comfort and compassion in times of grief or fear or despair. Holy God, we bring before you our prayers because we have full confidence that you hear us and you know us better than we know ourselves. And you know our hearts. For those we love, for those we don't know, we pray for your presence. We ask that you be present in places where there is so much violence, where children are afraid and mothers cry out and fathers disappear. Holy God, we know that you have a dream of us as united and peaceful. Be with the people of Lewiston, Maine, as they struggle with yet another mass shooting. Help us to find wisdom and courage, especially those who lead your people. Loving God, we give you thanks for Jesus, for the model he gave to us of living, for his witness to your wisdom and grace, for the hope that we have through Christ. We do all this in his name as he taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the kingdom and the power the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> Who we are and what we do and what we have is never separated from God. We are also in God's presence as we give. Let us share our gifts as God's gifts have been shared with us. For those of you worshiping online, please look at the back of the bulletin for giving opportunities.
Please join me in our offertory prayer. You, O oh God, are the one in whom we live and move and have our being. What a blessing. Use these gifts to bless others through this community of faith and in the wider world through mission and service. Amen. I love the words of that last hymn. Where everyone is seen as equal, where the vision is a world filled with love and peace. So this week, do what you can in the name of love and peace. And may the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>